10, Tar and Feather. This is something my mom always said to me when I was being too loud, boisterous, or distracting her from a task at hand. I'm sorry, mom, it's just what I do. Mind you, looking back, perhaps it wasn't my fault. Perhaps letting a hyper child eat chicken mac nuggets and soda after watching a bunch of 007 movies was not the right choice, mother. Hmm. I used to be a big 007 fan. After running all over my house, my mom would say, son, if you don't settle down, I'm going to tar and feather you. Well, in the times of Vikings, this was a legit punishment and for legit criminals. The crook's head would be shaven and covered in tar, which even that alone sounds horrible. And then a poof, I guess you describe it, of duck feathers was thrown onto his stickiness. He then would have to run through a gauntlet and everyone would be tossing stones and bricks because, well, I guess tar and feathers weren't enough. If you made it out alive, then no further punishment was required. Number nine, fines. Surprisingly enough, one of the most common punishments of the Viking era was fines. Nothing deters criminals like owing the governing body some cold hard cash. Except a lot of criminals don't really have any money, hence why they would steal in the first place, so owing money isn't exactly a great deterrent in my opinion. However, fines varied on the severity of the crime and who the person was or what the person was, and the law of the land really. Viking civilizations didn't exactly have a written law and would differ from different lands. All I know is that in Skyrim, which is loosely based on that of Scandinavian folklore and Norse mythology, that when I get fined for committing a crime that I only did because I pushed the wrong button, I promise it was an accident, I immediately pay the fine and pickpocket it back. It's not so bad. You pay a fine, you get away. It's not, it's not so bad. Number eight, banishment. Hey, look over there, it's Scorgamore, said Ulfric, or someone of another Norse-like name like that. Don't worry, Norse sounds confusing to me too. What's not confusing, however, and very straightforward, but still pretty harsh, is banishment. If someone was found guilty enough of a crime, they could be banished from the village. And in time of wild beast disease and, well, other Vikings eyeing your village the same way flies look at cow manure, it was dangerous to be alone for that extended period of time. So some people were forbidden to come back into town and don the name Skorgenmore. Grr. We'll go with that. Good luck in the winter. That's all I have to say. That's a tough life. Number seven, outlawed. This one is kind of interesting. So oftentimes when choosing the punishment for a criminal, it came down to fines, banishment, and outlying. And a lot of times, all three. Outlying went hand in hand with banishment. In a nutshell, it means you are no longer protected upon the laws of the land. So should someone maybe want a little revenge, there's not much you can do. Should have committed that crime there, cowboy. Like I said before, this was oftentimes done to those who were banished, so not only were they tossed out of the village, but also not protected by the village anymore. Pretty much leaving the criminal to nature and whatever she has to offer. And we all know Mother Nature, she can be a little, uh, a little rough sometimes. Woo. Number six, rodeo. If you're gonna be dumb, you gotta be tough. This world is rough, if a man's gonna make it, he's gotta be tough. Wise words from a trailer park supervisor. Huh? This one is just crazy, stupid, and violent, so strap in, folks. There was a trial, or a way of passage, if you want to call it that, that involved grease, a cow, and a criminal. You take the angriest cow in your herd, and you grease its tail up like a fat dude whose thighs have been chafing all day at a water park. The crook's hands would also be greased up. The cow was given a not too pita friendly poke from a farm tool, and the idea was while the cow was rightfully mad, kicking, stomping, and, uh, Mooing, the crook would have to hang on for as long as possible. If he did and didn't let go, then there was no charges. If he did fall off and slip and let go, then, uh, well, <laughs> so long von Schlurgenbergen for an Orl Ulfric. That's a Swedish name or something, I think. I don't know. Number five, drunk sword fighting and other things. Imagine letting a two-year-old hold a very sharp broadsword. Sounds like a bad idea, right? Well, nobody seemed to think so when they put swords in the hands of drunk vikings, which let's be honest, that's pretty much what a two-year-old is, is essentially like a drunk person walking around. Outdoors, vikings constantly wanted to one-up each other on the strength meter. They had weightlifting competitions, who could lift the heaviest stones, they wrestled, held archery contests, and of course, sword fighting competitions, as well as all the games Bree mentioned above. Were they sober? Probably not. They also had a game called Togo Honk, which was kind of like tug of war. Men would sit on the ground facing one another, press their feet together, and bend their knees. The goal was to try to straighten your opponent's legs and flip him over. Honestly, 
That sounds like a blast. Do you think it's a smart idea to put a sword in a drunk guy's hand? No, but it was the Viking era. There were literally no rules except for a few. At number four, not enough chairs. Now we know that these Viking celebrations would often last for days on end, right? So imagine if during all that time you couldn't sit anywhere comfortable. Sounds pretty unfortunate, but it was the reality of a lot of Viking parties. Because these gatherings were so big, hundreds of people would be in attendance, but unfortunately there wouldn't be enough space to sit. To try and accommodate their hundreds of guests, Vikings would break out their longest tables and benches, but usually this still wasn't enough space for everyone, so it became kind of a rule that only the most important people were allowed to sit. Chairs are thought to have been pretty rare, so the most powerful and wealthiest Vikings were allowed to sit in chairs. Everyone else had to fend for themselves, either sitting on uncomfortable benches or just standing around. Now doing this for a couple of hours? No problem. For a two week celebration? You can count me the heck out. If my tushy is not comfortable, I'm going home. Number three, fertility celebrations. So we talked a lot about what Vikings actually did back then and how they partied. Uh, they partied pretty hard. But now we're talking about what kind of festivals they had. This holiday is celebrated on April 30th in Finland, Sweden, and Germany, but goes all the way back to the Vikings. This night is called Waluburgas Night, or Waluburgas Night, or I probably said it wrong, but let me know, and is named after a woman called Valborg. She was born in 710 somewhere in Dorset slash Wessex as the niece of St. Boniface. She traveled with her brothers to Württemberg, Germany and became a nun. She lived in a convent of Heidenheim and became renowned for her healing powers and was canonized as a saint after she died. This celebration is in honor of her, however it was originally a pagan celebration called Beltane, a celebration of the return of summer. Viking fertility celebrations took place in and around April 30th and due to Valborg claiming this date as well, the two celebrations became one and the same eventually. Viking fertility celebrations usually involved sacrifice sacrificing an animal or two of some kind, and included all of the above. At number two, harvest slash winter night celebration. Next up in celebrations to mark on your calendar, we have the harvest slash winter night that took place on October 31st. It can also be referred to as elf blessing, this blessing, or fray blessing. Kind of like our spooky tradition today, it was a time of honoring the ancestral spirits, spirits of the land, the Vanir, along with the powers of fruitfulness, wisdom, and of course, death. A little brutal, yet kind of merciful in a way, the animals who were weren't going to be able to make it through the winter were smoked or made into sausage. It was often led by the women of the household. They left the last sheep in the field as an offering to Odin, though this varies. It also marks the start of something called the wild hunt. The roads and fields became territory of ghosts and trolls and marks the beginning of the darkest and coldest time of the year. The festivities and feasts are particularly joyous and they mainly aim to celebrate kinship, accomplishments, and the tales of the year. Last but not least, Yule. This last one is perfect for the season we are entering and a great way to end the list. The festival of Yule was, slash kind of still is, a celebration of 12 days. It was the most important of all Norse holidays and began on the night of December 20th. The god Ingvi Freyr rides over the earth on the back of his shining boar, bringing light and love back into the world. Later, Christianity influenced things, changing the god to Baldur, then Jesus who said to be reborn at the festival. For the Vikings, Yule signified the beginning and end of all things, taking place at the darkest time of the year. Children were said to leave their boots outside filled with hay and sugar for the gods journey and in return they would receive a little present. Sound familiar? On top of that, the celebration would include drinking, feasting, songs, games, banquets, and sacrifices to the gods and the ancestor spirits for the 12 days. They even had what was called a Yule tree, which inspired the use of the Christmas tree today. At number 10, non-stop party. What is the longest amount of time you've gone out to party? A couple hours, maybe a weekend? Well, I don't think it could ever compare to how long the Vikings partied. The Vikings would have probably had a good old chuckle if they knew our parties only lasted a few hours. Hours. They'd be like, ha, look at these weaklings. Anyway, these guys could probably out party anyone. Their biggest festivities, like the ones held after large expeditions or for weddings, would typically last for days, but their major feasts, like the ones they would use to celebrate the winter solstice, may have lasted upwards of 12 days. Now that's a lot of party stamina. I would probably need about 50 Red Bulls to even try and keep up with these Vikings. Number nine, actual really good food, like pretty decent food. If you're a foodie, then I do have some good news for you. The Vikings were apparently like, 
pretty decent cooks for the time anyways. They stock their parties with roasted meats like poultry, horse, and beef with platters of greens, fruits, and buttered vegetables. Beer, ale, mead, and fruit wines were the common beverages and heavy drinking was encouraged. Not unlike bars today where there's always that one person who keeps secretly buying tequila shots for everybody and then you're like okay fine I'll take it because I don't want to be rude, you know what I mean? Anyways, considering the fact that parties would sometimes last for weeks on end, having a lot of food in their party hut was super important. They needed enough to last them until the partying was done, which who knows when that would be. At number 8, rap battles. Every party has to have some kind of activity, right? I mean, yeah, we can all stand around listening to music and kicking it up, but it's way more fun to have activities to participate in, right? Well, the Vikings certainly knew how to throw a party because they had their collection of party activities to choose from, and it sounded kind of like a hoot and a half until we get to the other parts of this list and, you know, just throw that out the window. They would set up games like dice and chess, or at least their early Viking version of chess, and even board games. The Vikings also had this super fun drinking game called flighting where party goers would team up and recite poetry. They would drop some sick bars about their conquests and exploits and would even drop a diss or two at their opponents. Like a Drake versus Kanye moment. Oh wait, no, they're friends now. Damn. Well, scratch that last part, but you know what I mean. On top of rap battles and board games, Viking parties just wouldn't be a proper event without drinking, and they even played a game to see who could drink the most. Honestly, I kind of feel bad for the Viking's livers after all that, and imagine that hangover. Yikes. Number 7. Vicious Tunes Ever had a neighbor who would decide to throw a banger on like a weekday? Or have a roommate who thinks they are really good at guitar and wants to like prove it 24-7, they're like Wah! like 4 a.m. Yeah, it sucks. If you don't enjoy scenarios similar to this, then you would not want to live next door to a Viking encampment. These folks rocked out really hard and for, as we know, a long period of time. They loved live music, as do I, and archaeologists have recovered flutes, hornpipes, and stringed instruments from settlements. But as most of the singers were well into the mead, according to Arab travelers, they weren't easy on the ears? Like picture the moment Bohemian Rhapsody comes on in a bar and the screeches sounds everyone makes as they try to say Galileo like really loud. My voice is dead. That would be awful. One account described their singing comparable to the calls of wild animals. Oh boy, that's, that's rough. But sometimes they would switch it up with some poetry as mentioned by skilled artists called Scalds. At number 6, full send or no send. It seems like the Vikings lived by the notion full send or no send because man, did things get wild and crazy at their parties. There was no holding back with these guys. Oh no. I know I previously mentioned some of the activities that the Vikings would have at their parties, but those ones were the tame ones. And if you know the Vikings, they can't have PG friendly shindigs. Of course not. There's gotta be scenes of violence and coarse language. Viewer discretion is advised. Other than playing chess and having rap battles, they also had mass casualties. They played games where people literally kicked the bucket, but I guess dying at a party this wild is a good enough way to go. Some of their more dangerous party activities included throwing leftover bones at one another with the deliberate intent of inflicting bodily harm. They also played a full contact bat and ball game that would often end in injury or the big sleep. And they also held a swimming contest. But there wasn't that much actual swimming involved since the point of the game was to hold their opponent underwater for as long as possible. I would have to imagine that these so called games would just make for a vicious cycle because they'd celebrate something, play these games, kill someone and then the funeral will have them celebrating again just to do it all over again. What a wild life these Vikings lived. Number five, Meat Hook. Sometimes when given fines, it wasn't always cash value that was taken. Sometimes if the crime was heinous enough, the evildoer's property and items were taken instead. Well, sometimes folks didn't like having their stuff taken, which makes sense, they put up a fuss. No one likes their stuff getting taken. Just ask George Carlin, he knows a lot about that stuff. Everybody loves their stuff. In order for authorities to take possessions from the convicted, they would slice their ankles open, which just talking about that makes me sick. And then for good measure, tie them up and suspend them from the ceiling from a beam in their house. No, not unaliving them, keeping them very alive, just severely hindering their movement and ability to say, hey, get your hands off my limited edition Obi-Wan Kenobi Lego set. That one's mine. Number four, tree hugger. 
I hope you folks at home aren't eating during this video. It's about to get a little Mortal Kombat in here, if you will. Even though I watch videos when I eat. Carpet cleaning videos, anyone? Where's my lunch? You know what I mean? I, I, I love, I, I do weird things like that. I don't know. The second most horrible sentence the Vikings could bestow upon their criminals and dredges of their society involved a tree. I'll get to the first one later. It's pretty heinous. It involved a tree, a knife, and a squishy rope. Squishy rope? What? Yeah, I'll get to that. Trees being great symbols of Norse mythology and culture, it made sense to do this here. Shout out to Yggdrasil. Oh, cool stuff. You take your perpetrator and you carve open his belly like a high school jack o' lantern contest and you pull his intestines out and you keep pulling them out till you've got enough to wrap around the tree. And you basically tie him there. Except you don't wrap him around the tree, he walks himself around the tree until he's out of string, like a sick yo yo. Oh, gross. This was extremely painful and not quick at all, as humans can live for a couple hours without their squishy rope inside their belly. Not to mention, it probably attracted wild animals for a quick and easy meal. Not a good way to go. Don't recommend that. That's sick. That's twisted. Number three, drowning. Given the naval status of the Scandinavian nations at the time, it makes sense that they use water. It's simple, it's cheap, effective, and there's a lot of it. When a serious enough crime was committed, sometimes people were drowned, or in later terms, they ran out of oxygen underwater, tried to breathe underwater, overpowered by the tide, or was left unattended by the city swimming pool, if you catch my drift. Number two, trial by fire. There's water and there's fire, of course. Well, if cold water was too much for you, then this should warm you up. Trial by fire was more of a punishment uh, and less of a lethal one, if you will. If you survived the ordeal, that meant God was on your side. Thus, they couldn't be guilty because yeah, that, that totally works. The trial by fire included a couple different heat-based trials. No amount of red potion or Goron's tunic would get you through this. There was one version that saw people dip their hands in boiling water or oil, which right there, uh, you ever seen those like women's commercials where they dip the, nah, anyway. Walking across hot coals, which can be proven to be done without getting hurt. I saw it on Mythbusters once, so if it's on Mythbusters, that's just truth, folks, come on. Lastly, the one thing that I think is the worst is holding a hot stone or iron for a determined period of time. Yes, how long do you think you can hold into a red hot iron? I say not long. Even with seconds of exposure, you would have close to third degree burns, probably third degree burns on the palm of your hands, and long before polysporin, painkillers, and toilet paper. Not a good combo. That you, uh, don't, you have a burnt hand, you go to do that, you know? Ooh, that's not gonna be good. That's You're gonna get a little sick. Number one, this is the worst one on the list, the Blood Eagle. The Vikings were very creative, to say the least. I, I just had to include this one, it's awful. And in the style of Mortal Kombat, of course, you take a crook, and you take his back, and, and you rip his rib cage out of his back. It was cut out from the chest and positioned in such a way that it looked like an eagle with its wings flying, just, you know, with a lot of blood, hence, the Blood Eagle. After that amount of carnage, you would bleed out and experience excruciating pain. Not as common as other things on this list. It was safe for the worst of the worst, but yeah, it is the worst. No thank you. At number 10, cutting fingernails. Each civilization had their own specific beliefs, religions, and rites. For the Vikings, their belief in Norse mythology impacted a lot of their daily lives and even their burial rituals. One specific prophecy from their religion depicted the end of the world, and as anyone would, they tried to avoid that at all costs. In Norse mythology, Ragnarok was their version of the end of the world, and during this event, it was foretold that a lot of stuff was gonna happen, like giants and demons approaching and attacking the gods, and a ship called Nagfar would carry a fleet of giants. This ship was said to be made of the fingernails and toenails of the dead, and the bigger the ship, the more giants would come. Out of fear of this happening, the Vikings took every precaution to prevent Ragnarok and subsequently the arrival of this fingernail ship. To do this, the Vikings built into their burial rites a very important step, cutting the fingernails of the dead. The Vikings had to remove the fingernails of the dead so that they couldn't be used to build the giant ship, but other than their removal, no one really knows what they did with said fingernails. The Vikings were also said to have kept their own fingernails clean as to prevent the same outcome. At number 9, teeth filing. Many civilizations had body modifications as part of their culture through time. Mesoamerican civilizations were known to shape their skulls and alter their eyes, women in China altered the shapes of their feet for many years, and so many cultures around the world adorned themselves with tattoos, piercings, and scarifications. In Viking culture, their body modifications often included dental work. 
Evidence suggests that some Vikings filed horizontal lines into their teeth and some of them filled those grooves with red dye to make themselves look even more terrifying. Because the Vikings were known to be voyagers traveling the seas to new lands, some anthropologists believe that the Vikings may have picked up their idea for dental modification after making contact with people in West Africa as many tribes over there were known to file their teeth into different shapes. Would you guys ever do something like this or would you rather leave that up to the Vikings? Now before I continue telling you guys about the weird and crazy things that the Vikings did, let me first ask you guys to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far and maybe also consider subscribing to the channel to see more awesome videos like this one. At number 8, Carbon Monoxide The Vikings were pretty good builders, mainly of ships. Their ships were huge, intricate, and very impressive, but where they excelled in shipbuilding, they lacked in the construction of their homes and community buildings. Apparently, the longhouses that they built for their communities were actually pretty unsafe to be in and trapped a lot of toxic gases inside of them. Researchers from a university in Denmark recreated one of the Vikings longhouses and lit a fire in the center of it, like the Vikings would have done back in the day. After simulating an average living environment and monitoring the atmosphere inside of the longhouse, they realized that there wasn't enough ventilation to prevent carbon monoxide and nitrogen dioxide from building up inside. This would have led to a lot of people getting sick, especially those who spent long periods of time inside. The Vikings didn't know that though, but they also had their own remedies for curing sickness, so I don't think that they would have thought much of it. At number 7, Onion Soup Speaking of Viking home remedies though, they had some pretty interesting ones. Every civilization had their own takes on medicine and healing their sick and injured, and the Vikings were no doubt the same. For them though, soup was their tool for healing, and for x-rays. Sort of. These days we eat soup when we're sick to warm up our bodies and balance out our sodium levels and doctors have actually proven that eating chicken soup actually does make you feel better when you have a cold, but Vikings didn't really have the same idea. For them, onion soup was their thing and they used it to diagnose people. Viking healers would make up a pot of really strong onion soup and feed it to a warrior who had a wound around their abdomen. Once the person drank the soup, the healer would see if they could smell the soup through the wound. If he could, then the wound was fatal and there was no sense in trying to save the person, so they would just move on to the next warrior. It saved the healer time trying to attend to everyone, but it kinda sucked for the person who got left behind because not only are they not going to make it, but their last meal was that awful onion soup. At number 6, Blood Eagle We all know that the Vikings were a ruthless group of people, but their methods of execution really painted a clear picture of how terrifying these guys were and how they had a colorful imagination when it came to imagining new ways to unalive somebody. The Vikings came up with a method of execution called the Blood Eagle and yes, it is just as terrifying as you would expect with a name like that. The Blood Eagle basically involved cutting someone up to make it look like an eagle. They would cut apart the rib cage and then spread it apart to make it look like wings and then after that, while this person was still alive mind you, they would pour a salt solution over the wound, pull out the lungs and arrange them over the rib cage to again, make it look like wings so that this person could flutter away into the afterlife. Now the mysterious part of all this is that historians aren't exactly sure if this was actually a real method of execution or if it was just embellished in viking records to make them sound cooler. I for one hope that it wasn't actually real because that sounds brutal, but when it comes to Vikings, you never really know. In our number 5 spot today we have Alfheim. This is actually a location that is said to be one of the nine worlds in Norse cosmology. The nine worlds are often highly debated and this one is only mentioned twice in the old Norse texts, but it is a very important place nonetheless. This place is said to be an abode of the elves, which are a class of demigod-like beings from this pre-Christian mythology and religion. Since its place isn't talked about very much in the text, there isn't a lot that is known about it, but it is said that only light elves live here while dark elves live down in the earth, and that these two kinds of elves are unlike in appearance but even more unlike in nature. This gets even more concerning when we take into consideration their description. Light elves are described as being luminous and quote, more beautiful than the sun. Dark elves on the other hand are said to be blacker than pitch. Either way, the light elves are the ones who inhabit the land of Alfheim 
and the land itself is looked over and ruled by the Vanir goddess Freyr. Number four, horned helmets. When you think of Vikings, you probably imagine a very large man, right, with a giant beard, wearing armor covered in fur, and perhaps a helmet with a couple of horns sticking right out on the side, nice and nice and aggressive. We see Vikings depicted this way in movies, television, you name it. But was it historically accurate? Nay, no, false, not really. Well, aside from looking cool, this would have served no purpose in you know an actual combat, unless there was a guy specifically headbutting individuals. The horned helmet was not historically accurate at all. The horned helmets were only introduced into Norse culture when costume designer Carl Emil Doppler made them for Norse-themed operas in the 19th century. So yeah, false. They just wore their heads. So big Viking heads. In our number three spot today, we have Niflheim. This is a type of hell that comes from Norse mythology, and rather than being a fiery pit like a lot of us think of when we think of hell, it's actually a frozen landscape. This place is ruled by Hel, who is the goddess of death and the daughter of Loki. It is actually believed that her name might be where the name for the Christian underworld came from. I feel like I mentioned Christianity a lot in this. I don't know why. It's just a coincidence. Niflheim is located next to the shore of corpses, which is where Nidhogg lives. If you're wondering who that is, it's of course only the giant snake that feeds on the dead, because why not, I guess? There are said to be nine worlds in Norse mythology, and Niflheim is the deepest and darkest one. It is said that souls are brought here by Hell's messenger, and from here the souls are simply just kept in constant pain. Number two, go berserk. Unlike the fancy horned helmets, Viking berserkers were real. That part was historically accurate. And let me tell you, these guys specifically, they were terrifying. These Viking warriors would arrive to battle decked out in bearskins. Now the term originally meant to change form, right? Berserker, to change form, transformers, right? All the same kind of combat. So they were emulating a bear while walking into combat. Imagine being the other guy, you'd be scared shitless. Berserkers were considered a higher power when it came to battle. Yeah, no shit. They were the big dogs, or more accurately as they were described back then, mad dogs. More often than not, berserkers could take an opponent down with one single strike. How did they do it, right? Besides having a large build naturally, how did they win so many battles? How were they relied on so often? Today we have an idea of what may have helped aid the fight, and it's uh, it's bad stuff. It's all illicit substances. Yeah, they would just do some not so great stuff and then run into battle screaming, hopped up on something. The odds that berserkers were on something going into every battle, those odds were pretty high. They're pretty high. In our number one spot today, we have Ragnarok, also known as the Doom of the Gods. We can't fully appreciate. This the new god of war without really knowing what this story is portraying to some degree. Ragnarok would have been the most feared word for the Norse, or perhaps a word that changed their outlook on the world. This was a fate that no one, not even Odin, could escape. At the time, there was a belief that there were different ages, the axe age, the sword age, the wolf age, so on, before the world would fall. There would then be three years of absolute chaos that included famine and sickness, and following this would be an all-out war in the heavens. This war would see the gods facing everything. Yotuns, giant wolves, giant serpents, and most importantly, Loki, who broke free from his chains and was ready for revenge. This fate saw the fall of the gods and the fire giant Surt burned the entire world to ashes, killing almost every living thing. While this is a super depressing fate to believe the world will meet, there was a glimmer of hope. After Ragnarok, there was rebirth. It was believed that a new world would arise from the ashes. Number 10, Boulder. When looking at ancient myths and stories for a while, you'll come to notice some shocking similarities in these cultures' stories. Some of these cultures interacted with one another and some did not, which to me says, we're just good storytellers. The tale of Baldur is like that of Achilles, a young and strong warrior made invincible by his mother. Mothers have that ability. Achilles was dipped in the river Styx. Baldur was given a spell, each with their own weakness and each with their own invulnerability. Achilles and his heel, Baldur and, uh, well, a, a mistletoe. Loki made a dart out of one, and uh, Baldur wasn't so invincible anymore. Boy, that Loki guy sure causes a lot of trouble. Also, if you played God of War, the climactic scene at the end with Baldur, ooh, especially troubling. You know what I'm talking about. Good stuff, good story. Number nine, Yggdrasil. The big bad tree that you see every time you see Norse stuff. A connection between all the nine realms and a place where Norse gods deliberate on godly matters. I don't know what that is, but they talk there sometimes. It's kind of like when your parents talk in the room. You know what they're talking about, but you know it's important. 
It's almost as if people knew how important trees were. I mean, we use trees for everything. Paper, houses, sometimes people on the west coast are like a different kind of tree. You know what I'm saying there, brother? <laughs> I got Chris, I got him, he's laughing. I like to make Chris laugh. You guys gotta laugh sometimes. The tree is life. It represents life, brother. Kind of like what trees actually do in real life. I swear, one of the first lessons I ever got in school was that tree equals good, and we need tree, so don't cut down tree. We need to breathe, please. I swear it was one of my first lessons, maybe because I'm, we're Canadian, I grew up in the, in the fort, like in the hillbilly country, I don't know, but that's what I learned. Number eight, Ragnarok. The apocalypse, the end times. When mom says I have to eat my dinner before I eat cookies. Oh, it's the end of the world. Uh, let's be honest, I never really had an issue with eating. Come on, let's just be, let's just be real here, come on. Ragnarok is the prediction of end times, and every civilization has their own. Ragnarok is slightly different though from its counterparts, as instead of one event like a giant tsunami or a flood, it's more of a series of events that are the signs of end times. Kind of like uh, Call of Duty. First it was greedy microtransactions, then it was jetpacks. Lately, it's just unbalanced hackers. All signs of the end times. Number seven, Loki. Lord of Tricks, God of Mischief. Everyone knows who Loki is, most likely due to some very successful superhero movies in the last few years. But the same may know him regardless, known for many tricks and evil deeds. His best trick, or whatever you want to call it, is shape-shifting. Loki has the ability to transform into any creature and any gender, which to me, that's just the best superpower. I mean, come on, you can legit be any living thing. That's gotta be cooler than a shield or just getting really green and angry. And for people that don't have that ability to see through these tricks, it often leads to a lot of misfortune, like the previously mentioned Balder and perhaps another related story that I'll get to later, we'll see. Number six, Valkyries. Oh yes, the beautiful Valkyries. For such a gorgeous image, they have a rather grim job. Whenever someone falls in battle, it's up to these lovely ladies to guide them to the afterlife. In a way, they're kind of like battle angels. Pretty cool. It literally translates to chooser of the slain. Norse mythology, like a lot of others, has its fair share of violence, but hey, I guess if I fell in battle, I'd want to be carried off by a gorgeous woman who can fly. I hope you folks have been praying towards Odin, otherwise you won't be able to make it to Valhalla, which is bad because that's where all the good little Viking men and women go. So they can be with their ancestors and drink meat all day, which, dude, drinking, you ever had meat? It's delicious. Yes, please. Sign me up. Oh, I love mead so much. At number five, building fires. The Vikings were some pretty innovative people, but they were also kind of gross. This gross behavior applied to a lot of things, but one of those things was their fire building. Now you're probably asking yourself, Bree, what's so gross about making a fire? Well, it's the way that they started the fire that was kind of grody. You see, nowadays we have a bunch of things that we can use to start a fire. We have matches, lighters, lighter fluid, and a bunch of other things. But obviously back in the days of the Vikings, they didn't have those fire starting tools, and so they had to improvise. The Vikings came up with a nifty little trick to start a fire where they took a fungus called touchwood and they would beat it and burn it until it turned into a thin flat thing that kind of looked like felt. Then they decided to get gross and would then boil the touchwood in human urine because urine contains sodium nitrate, which would help the touchwood turn into something that would smolder rather than burn. They could then take this stuff with them and use it to start fires whenever they wanted so they could cook food over their urine fueled fire. Sounds delightful. And number four, conning. Conning people has been something that's kind of been part of many societies since probably the dawn of civilization. Anyone can con anyone into doing anything or buying anything. I mean, people do it on eBay all the time. But apparently, the Vikings were also known to con people probably for their own enjoyment, because they're Vikings. Back in the day, the Vikings would do trades with the Inuit people and they would acquire narwhal tusks from them. The Vikings would then sell those tusks to other people, marketing them as unicorn horns, and let's face it, no one's gonna turn down buying a unicorn horn. Because of the Vikings and their conning ways, by the Middle Ages, people not only believed that unicorns were actually real, but that they also had magical powers. So in a way, if you were obsessed with unicorns as a kid, you can thank the Vikings for that. At number three, house bears. Humans seem to be pretty good at domesticating animals. We domesticated dogs by accident, and now they're considered man's best friend. We domesticated livestock for food and other purposes. We domesticated horses to be our transportation and carry things. So we kind of know our way around animals and could probably make anything into our pet if we really wanted to. But the Vikings weren't just satisfied with dogs, horses, and livestock. 
They were the mighty Vikings and they needed mighty pets, and that's why they kept bears as their companions. Yes, bears. Now don't get me wrong, the Vikings also had normal pets like dogs and cats, and they would even sometimes bring them along on their expeditions, but they also really liked bears. It is said that when they weren't out laying siege to someone's town or sailing the seas, the Vikings would visit bear dens and take bear cubs home with them. They would then raise the cubs as house bears. But having a house bear was also a very big responsibility. You had to make sure that your bear was kept in check at all times, so that meant no eating people or livestock, no disturbing your neighbors, and if your bear did get into trouble, you would either get hit with a fine or be banned from having a house bear. So maybe it's best to stick with normal pets like dogs. Hi number two, worthy kids. The Vikings were ruthless even when it came to their spawn. I mean their kids. These guys were really picky when it came to having a family because they weren't afraid to just yeet their kids if they didn't like them enough. Back in their day, when a baby was born, they would christen their kid with a name during a ceremony called Asavatni, but only after determining if this kid was even worth raising in the first place. You see, when a baby was delivered, the child would be placed on the ground for the father to then pick up and examine. He would be looking for any physical deformities, disabilities, and to determine if the kid was actually his or not. He would decide if the kid had a future. If they did, then they would hold the Asavatni ceremony where water was sprinkled on the kid's head and given a name, and if they weren't worth Worthy, then they would be left outside in the elements and abandoned. And finally at number one, criminal profiling. It turns out that the Vikings kind of invented criminal profiling. You see, when the Viking horde would set off to battle, there was no telling how they would return. You have to remember that these guys were bloodthirsty and violent and there was no telling what was going on in their heads. I mean, don't even get me started on the whole berserker rage thing because that itself is very intense. But basically, when the Horde would return home, they seemed to have caused a lot of problems because many of them couldn't turn off their rage and would just wreak havoc on the town. To deal with this, it is said that a series of Icelandic sagas were written as a sort of profile to warn the homegrown Vikings of what to look out for when the others would return. They had to kind of alter their stories a little bit because if they were too specific, then it would have caused people to learn to be afraid of basically any Viking man, so they had to keep things a little generic, but for the most part, people learned to stay away from those who couldn't turn off the berserker rage at home in order to keep themselves and the rest of their community safe. Now before I wrap things up for today, I want you guys to leave a comment telling me what the most fascinating thing that you learned from this list was. The Vikings did a lot of questionable and mysterious things, so let me know what surprised you the most down below. Number 10. Unfaithful. Viking warriors were large, strong, tough, and rough men who drank like fish and partied like it was 1999. Remember, I do. I wouldn't go as far as to call the Coastal Raiders gentlemen. Since, well, they were not gentlemen. It's fair to say that they weren't exactly so nice to their women. For example, it wasn't that uncommon for a Viking male to take a bed with his wife. It was also not uncommon for a Viking man to take a bed with someone other than his wife. Which, unless you're a collection of certain people from Utah, that's not okay. Not that I'm here to judge anyone from Utah or the Vikings, but I believe if you fall in love, you gotta stay within those boundaries of that marriage. It's just traditionally a two-person party, not four or five. Number nine, revenge. Signy was a sweet lass who unfortunately married King Seeger, a rather nasty and brutal king. He would earn his malicious title when he had Signy's family unalived, except for her and her twin brother. But wait, there's more. Signy then plotted revenge with her sibling by meeting up with a sorcerer who changed her appearance. She then went back to her brother where they engaged in three nights of awkwardness and shame only a family watching in force ghost form could witness. She then changed forms again to give birth to her son that would assist in her revenge. Eventually they overthrew the Mad King and set him on fire for his misdeeds, where she then also willingly walked into the fire because she felt like she was no longer fit to live. That is one wild story. Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned, I guess. Number 8. Love Triangle There once was a maiden so fair and so beautiful, apparently the most beautiful and smart. Sounds like a winner to me. Gudrun was her name, and she was stuck in an unfortunate love triangle. Kajartan and Boli were friends and foster cousins. Kajartan immediately fell for the beautiful Gudrun. His father, however, did not exactly approve of this fling, as he felt she was kind of sus due to her previous marital adventures. So while holding Kajartan back, Boli went to swoon the beautiful lass. 
This worked. However, shortly after being distracted by a trip, Gujartan finds out that his love is now in an entanglement with his best friend Boli. This leads to a confrontation where Kajartan is struck with one blow by Boli that claims his life. Boli instantly filled with regret, the same way Anakin felt when confronting Palpatine and Mace Windu, and a what have I done sort of moment. It was awkward, but their story was a little bit easier to understand. I don't know, bad dialogue. Number seven, Volun the Smith. Volun the Smith was in love with a Valkyrie, which honestly is just really cool. Come on, I mean, who gets to be in, in love with a Valkyrie? And after a brief marriage, the Valkyrie had to go back to what they do best, which is to pick up soldiers who have perished in battle. As Volund was going full Marvin's room over the grief of his loss, he was kidnapped by a king who imprisoned him to marry his daughter. The king was so serious that he had Volund's hamstrings cut, so he could not escape his captivity. So to get back at the king, he slayed his two sons, and fashioned a goblet with jewels made from their eyes. Knocked up the king's daughter and blew that popsicle stand. Sure, it wasn't his wife yet exactly, but she was going to be if he hadn't have turned her brothers into everyone's least favorite set of dinnerware. Take note of this one, folks. Don't do this one at home. Number six, Leif Erikson Day. Yes, the very same from SpongeBob SquarePants. Leif Erikson, the first European to land in North America. Hundreds of years before everyone's new, least favorite explorer, Christopher Columbus, discovered the Americas. A Viking man leads an expedition that honestly must have been just the worst. Sea travel just wasn't great back then. This really was a huge moment in history, one for the ages. But imagine breaking the news to his wife. Listen, honey, I know you've been hard at work cleaning and cooking and taking care of our children. And we both know I've been a great husband with all my drinking and fighting and all the mistresses I may or may not keep. So I just want you to know that I'm going to sail across the ocean for months and build a settlement in a completely different corner of the earth. Okay, bye. <laughs> See you later. Yeah, I'll write you. <laughs> Number five, housewife. Ladies, I hear you. No woman wants to be told by a man to cook, clean, and be a housewife. But for Viking wives, this was half the case. Not so much misogynistic as it was just really a necessity. While a lot of Viking life was more than naval raids and pillaging, and while women warriors most likely took part in said pillaging, the women in Viking civilizations did a lot of work at home. Cooking, making clothes, and a whole list of duties that I know I could never do. Truth of the matter is, Vikings were big burly fighters and still required the tender care of a woman. All patriarchy aside, imagine how hard life would have been back then without one another. As for today, I don't think you understand how hard it would be for me personally to sew a hole in my own clothes. Many of underwear have been lost to me not being able to sew so long underwear. Number four, score! I heard you work for the companions. What do you do, fetch the mead? That's a Skyrim reference for anyone that's not sure what that is. It should come as no surprise to anyone that the Vikings enjoyed a little drinky poo once in a while, and by that I mean all the time. Famous for their beers, meads, and wines, Vikings drank to drink for just about any reason, really. Alcohol played a big role in Viking society, as did in many other civilizations of the past. However, this may have had something to do with the mistreatment of their wives. Think about it for a minute. Has your dad ever been drinking a whole case of beer in the sun on a hot summer weekend, where he then proceeded to say things that he's been thinking but needed the liquor courage to say it? And when he said these things, was it not the most nonsensical thing you ever heard? Well, I'm sure that happened to the Vikings too. Just, it was freezing cold out and the men weren't wearing a fresh pair of white sneakers for mowing the lawn, which doesn't really make any sense when you think about it. This may be why women were allowed to leave marriages if they were mistreated. Number three, divorce process. Unlike other women in Europe, Viking women had the option to opt out of their marriages. A divorce for other women in Europe may just cost them their lives. Looking at you, King Henry VIII, However, the process of divorcing is rather awkward. Not that I would know, but I feel like a divorce should be somewhat of a private matter. Unless, of course, you're 90s trailer trash and you end up on Jerry Springer. That ain't my baby. That is not my baby. But even regular folks like you and me can still have their dirty laundry out to air, especially if your marriage is property and children to decide over. Well, not as messy as daytime television from a forgotten era, the Vikings made their divorces rather public, as that was the divorce process itself. The woman would have to call witnesses to the married bed, or rather just the home, and declare she was divorced. Imagine being pulled off a grueling day's work to be told the lady from the other side of the village is getting divorced. I'm gonna get back to my farm, lady. Jeez. Number two. Far out, man. As if drinking copious amounts of ale and mead wasn't enough to upset a marriage, how about some recreational use of some wacky substances? 
Vikings were known for going in a berserker mode when in battle. A seemingly blind fit of rage that would see anyone or anything in the Vikings way cut down without mercy. There may have been an answer for this aberrant behavior. Mushrooms. Yes, that kind. Some scientists believe that these mushrooms with mind altering effects grew in areas not too far from the Vikings, and once discovered would lead to some interesting results. Because a large man with a very sharp axe and a belly full of beer is exactly who should be consuming the same kind of mushrooms that may or may not make Pink Floyd's album sound 10 times better. Number 1. Naughty Naughty. The chief came sailing into port today and said this isn't it. That's right, I did two chief jokes today because that's how messed up this is. Viking men of the past, I'm putting you in the naughty corner, bad Vikings. See, like previously mentioned, Vikings were more than just coastal pirates. They had villages, farms, etc. Just like the rest of Europe. But alas, they did do some pillaging. Oftentimes when going on a raid, one of the many things that was taken from other civilizations and villages was women. Oh yes, not just stocks of gold and grain, but the villages women too. Where they would be taken back to the Vikings, where they would be put into YouTube's least favorite S word for um, well, you could probably guess what for. Some were married off and some were probably put to work. This is why the Vikings are going in the naughty corner. At least the women could divorce, right? Number 10, patterns. Yeah, I don't know about you guys, but I'm starting to notice a pattern. What's that pattern exactly? Well, I'm starting to notice that maybe other Europeans were nicer than at least mainlander ones. I'll get into it. Was Vikings giving their women's rights messed up? No, of course not. I'm not a monster. However, you just gotta understand that a lot of other women in Europe did not share these privileges, like owning property, marriage rights, they even had the right to be warriors. While only a small fraction of women were involved, there are a couple sources that refer to female warriors, such as the War Maidens. Now, mind you, Vikings were coastal raiders, not so much a professional army, but still, it's about the freedoms, so you slay on, Valkyrie warrior, slay on. Number nine, marriage. Okay, well, there was more freedom, but let's be honest, this was a long time ago and not 2022, so not everything was perfect. The marriages were oftentimes arranged by both families and watched over by elders. What's the average age of a bride-to-be, you ask? Well, the bride is a little bit older, and some might call it a midlife crisis, but she's getting married at the age of 13. Lucky number. Sadly, this is just how it went for many civilizations of the day. I'll make the joke again that you don't have that long to live back then, so sure, it makes sense, I guess. Just looking back through the lens of time just makes my skin want to crawl when you do the ugh, yucky. I'll stick to the coastal raiding and the pillaging, thanks. Number eight, grooms, tombs, and drogers. Ladies, wasn't your wedding night beautiful, surrounded by friends and family, a nice meal, and if you've been married long enough, maybe even some bad hair and tuxedos that went out of fashion the second you walked off the altar all while being recorded on the first camcorders that were big enough to be bazookas. God, I miss the 70s and 80s. Well, Vikings had some weird things going on too. No, not those bright blue tuxedos. I never understood how that was in style. It was just really weird. Vikings had this tradition where the groom would raid his family's tomb and retrieve a ceremonial weapon. Afterwards, he would take a very hot bath and sweat out the scent of the tomb, I guess? I'm not really sure. Where then his hair was stylized and somewhere a symbol of four was placed on him. I don't know about you guys, but that sounds like a lot. I prefer our tradition of drinking too much in the sun before the wedding starts and falling over at the altar. That's a much better one. Number seven, blood. Ladies, if your husband's dungeon crawling wasn't enough to creep you out, then the poor Viking women had more strange traditions for you. The Gothi, or basically a Viking priest, who makes the wedding happen would often sacrifice an animal in front of the whole wedding to prove that he was capable of commencing a wedding, pouring blood on himself and oftentimes spraying the newlyweds as it was seen as good for some strange reason. For immediate family, you might want to sit back as you're in the splash zone. And because this is the time before well-taught and understood sanitation, I'm sure there was a grand feast afterwards. I'm sure that won't make anyone sick, right? Number six, quiet time. You might be thinking to yourself, okay, Big Chad, having blood sprayed on me at my wedding is kind of messed up, but you haven't made your chief joke yet. Does that mean there's something worse than impersonating 1976 Carrie at our wedding? Well, yes, yes there is, and actually I'm glad you asked. So, when two people fall in love and get married, and maybe have a little bit too much champagne, they go home to put on the final signatures of the marriage. 
if you catch my drift. Two young lovers dancing the devil's dance in the bedroom sheets for the first time because everybody waits until marriage. However, for Viking women, there's a tradition that us today would be mostly uncomfortable with. Or, I mean, at least if you don't have an OnlyFans, maybe not, I don't, I, I don't know. But when the young couple went back to do what young couples do, they had witnesses. Oh yeah, that's right, at least six witnesses apparently, just to make sure things go over smoothly. I moseyed on into town the other day and uh, you know what the chief said? That ain't it. Number five, Eric the Red. Probably the most infamous Viking who ever lived, and the father of Leif Erikson was Eric the Red. He earned this name most likely because of his gorgeous red hair and beard, or it could be because he's the bloodthirsty Viking of your worst nightmares. When you think of the classic Viking, this is really what comes to mind. A drinking brute who could cleave a man in twain with a swing of his war axe. What I'm getting at is, getting bloodstains out of clothes is difficult today, but imagine what it was like back then. Yikes! Ladies, how many times has your husband come home from his blue collar job and just gotten himself into a mess? Also, take your boots off before you come into the house, dude. Come on, that's just not cool. Eric the Red most likely did the same, however, he was not covered in mustard from lunch or grease stains in the garage, but rather the fluids that could only come from separating body parts from unwilling donors. I get lightheaded just thinking about it, no thanks. Number four, strong, independent woman. Freydis was sister of Leif Erikson and daughter of Eric the Red. She had some strong blood in her. While not exactly Leif's wife, this story is just too messed up to not tell. This one goes to all the mothers out there. Remember your first child, remember the joys of your first pregnancy. For some lucky women, this is an easy experience, but for others, well for others it's difficult to say the least. You might notice that your body is changing and all of a sudden you're really craving food you haven't had in a long time. You may also feel a little queasy in the morning and many other little fun things that happen. Well, Freydis, the sister of Leif Erikson, went on that North American expedition with him, whilst pregnant, which I can also imagine was just a beautiful pleasure cruise. However, her level of seasickness is not what's so messed up here, but rather that she had to defend herself by swinging a sword whilst very pregnant. That's a down bad woman right there. Number three, red flags. Dating can be fun. You get to meet new people and experience new things, mini golf, movies maybe even some nice restaurants. However, sometimes when we go on dates, they make better stories than experiences. Sometimes people give off red flags. People who put ketchup on pizza is a red flag for me. That's that's wrong, don't, don't do that. Meet Egil Skalgrimason. No, he didn't put ketchup on pizza, but he was a mean, no good, rotten man of a Viking but apparently was also an excellent poet. As the legends go, he got his first taste of blood when he was seven, when another young man crossed him. He then reached for his axe. You know what happens next. He grew up to be just the way you think Vikings grow up to be, and his violence carried on throughout his life. However, unlike most barbaric coastal raiders of the time, Eagle was also thought to be somewhat of a prolific writer, as his poems are considered to be some of the best from ye olde Scandinavia. Ladies, I don't have to tell you how toxic this is, right? This is a big red flag energy. Imagine getting in a brutal confrontation with him, and then he turns around and makes it into a compelling poem. Red flags all the way. No thanks. Number two, pay to win. Ragnar Lodbok isn't just a name that sounds like he could be a Dovahkiin from Skyrim. It's a name that struck fear into many Anglo and Franco kingdoms at the time. You never know when someone like Ragnar would show up in a boat with 30 other burly Vikings and just mess up your day royally. One royal that did not want his day being royally screwed up by Ragnar paid him to stop Vikingizing his village. Vikingizing is a word I'm gonna use. Which honestly is like asking water not to be wet. Yes, water is wet, the debate starts and ends there. Perhaps Ragnar was actually close in similarities to the Dovahkiin, as I find it's easier to stop using my dragon shout when gold comes my way. Well, if he had to be paid off like a goon for hire, you could imagine how sweet and caring he was to his wives. Yeah, probably not, no. Number one, Vikings. Look, this is another broad stroke, but guys, these are Vikings, and this was ye olde Europe. Yes, women did have more freedoms than others in Viking society, but it's, it's just not a good time. And honestly, if you try looking through any lens of the present into the past, you're gonna find some things you don't like. Vikings were Vikings, and unfortunately for women at the time, that just meant they got the raw end of the deal, for a multitude of reasons. Whew. Glad we live in today, not then. Number 10, Thrall Traders. Now look, Vikings weren't all that bad. 
world. Sure, they would go off to other countries and lands and raid and pillage for a bit of sport. They'd de-life you and your family or they would take the people from your village that could do some good manual labor and bring them back to the market where they were sold to other Vikings as thralls. But okay, you know what? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not really making this any better. Uh, the selling and purchasing of actual people has unfortunately been a successful business strategy in almost every single corner of the world for as long as there have been people to do it. And the Vikings were not exempt from this. While it was a standard way of living at the time, the people who actually auctioned off thralls for silver and gold pieces or for goods like furs, weapons, livestock, and food, by our standards, were the worst of the worst of people. To make the life of another human being nothing more than a product is pretty disgusting. Gotta love how people just always treat each other so nicely. Life for a Viking thrall was anything but pleasant, but they were a part of Viking society. We'll get to that later though. Number 9. Hunters Yes, a lot of Scandinavian life had domesticated animals. We wouldn't be here without that. But this isn't the time of industrial agriculture. You can't just walk into your local butcher and demand to speak to the manager when there's a lack of product. Trouble is, I think a lot of modern folks just don't know how difficult the process of hunting can be. Now, hunting is a way of R&R, &R, a unique hobby that can give you a respect of nature and where your food comes from. Or it's a way to binge drink in a small cabin with three other men trying to get away from their wives. Vikings just didn't have it that easy. No catch, no food. For my taste though, in a time before gunpowder and rifles, stick to the small animals. Trying to take down a bear with arrows, that, that just can't be easy. Number 8. Shipbuilders Vikings got around. All around. Not just Europe, but a large part of the known world. Even discovering places all by themselves. They were experts at building boats. They had dragon ships, nars, merchant ships, and a whole bunch of other kinds of water vehicles. But the most famous of all their ships would be their longboats. They used longboats to travel the world and to go on their famous vacations when they would go Viking. The dudes responsible for building these things are also responsible for the nightmares they gave all the monks and soldiers who lived in England and other European countries, assuming they survived. Imagine, it's a nice, crisp morning. You're just waking up for the long day ahead of you. You step outside to take it all in. Oh, what's that in the distance? A large, flat-bottomed oak boat with the head of a serpent or a dragon with 50 to 60 large, hairy, sweaty, angry-looking men who are coming to put you in the ground or kidnap you, take your stuff, and burn your house to the ground? You know who you have to thank for this? Yeah, it's the Viking shipbuilder. Number 7. Blacksmith Being a blacksmith is a very difficult task. Red hot iron, hammers striking and forging the metal that makes our lives possible. Sure, we don't use them as much as we did in the past, but someone's gotta make horseshoes! Shout out to all the equine lovers out there, I see you. The point I'm getting to here is that in a time before power hammers and modern techniques, it's a long process. It takes time and skill. Some might even call blacksmithing an artisan craft, especially since a lot of the things that required a blacksmith to be a blacksmith, like making swords obviously, and shields and spears, but you gotta think about everything else. Door hinges, iron fittings, bolts, brackets. It's an important job in the Iron Age. What's messed up is how dangerous it is. Anyone working with metal will tell you how rough that can be. In a time before hospitals, burn treatments, and antibiotics, I would be careful on the grind wheel. Number 6. Settlers Life in the Scandinavian countries was not easy. Summers were like two days long and winters would last so long Andrew could actually move his box over to finish the filming on time. Hey! A large percent of the Vikings were farmers, but the soil there was not good. So, as more and more Vikings were born and families grew, some people decided to jump ship and move away. Or try to. They'd show up in England like, Hi, so I know we kinda just like totally raided you or whatever, but um, <laughs> we would love your land and we're gonna settle here, okay, cool. This was usually met with the pointy end of a three foot sword. They would settle in areas like Britain, the Netherlands, Germany, France, Spain, Portugal, and Russia. Some successfully, some not so much. They did successfully settle Iceland and Greenland though, with their population in Iceland reaching like 50,000. When they went to Vinland, otherwise known as Newfoundland, they settled for about 5 minutes before the Native Americans drove them out. Being a settler back in the time of the Viking was a necessity for some, but a death wish for most. Number 5. The First Raid 
The first official Viking raid took place in 793 AD. These Viking raiders left such a huge mark on history that we refer to this time period as an age, just like the Middle Ages we have the Viking Age. It officially lasted from 793 to 1066, the year of the last big Viking battle. I said I'll get into that later on. I didn't. I just talked about hockey and slap fatten. Departing from agrarian pagan Scandinavia, settlers and traders rolled up to England and they arrived in Lidensfarne, and then from then on they just invaded hundreds of settlements. Now English kings were ruling over coastal areas at the time and they needed to start making defense plans from all these seagoing pagans that everybody's now talking about. Imagine hearing about pirate vikings, I'd be like, what, who are these, they have what, beards and axes? Number four, Viking funerals. Now, I know this isn't messed up per se, but I really wish that we still did Viking funerals. They would be way more fun, I don't know, instead of carrying that 900 pound casket down that aisle for like 14 city blocks, Vikings would do it in one of two ways, and both were pretty epic to witness, I'm sure. One way, they would bury the body, the classic, right? They would leave stone circles around the shallow graves that they dug, or do these burial mounds, or grave fields, usually after a battle. Vikings were pagan, they believed that the more smoke there was during a cremation, the better. The smoke was their way of reaching the afterlife. Boats also symbolized safe passageway to the afterlife in Norse mythology, so Vikings would shape these stones around the grave like a ship or a boat. But high-ranking Norsemen, they would be buried with their boats. In 834 AD, the Osberg ship burial honored two women, and this ship vessel was massive. It was 70 feet long and 17 feet wide, had 15 oars on each side. It was discovered in Norway on a farm, so the whole shooting an arrow while they're at sea thing, that sadly wasn't common. It wasn't a thing at all, really. Because if you missed, you just gave away the Osberg and you botched the funeral. Way to go. I know, sorry, I know. Number three, hit the slopes. Vikings didn't invent skiing by any means, but they did make it cooler. The name skiing actually comes from an old Norse term that means to stride on skis, and Viking would hunt on these skis. They got so good at hunting down elk on these skis that a law had to be written in order to protect them from going extinct. That's how good they got. The Gulathing Law of 1274, it was written in Norway, and it outlaws the hunting of elk while on skis. You probably read that and you're like, who the, what? Skiing was such a big advancement for Vikings that there's two Norse gods involved in the sport. We have Ullr, the god of snow, and Skadi. Imagine these two showing up in the next Thor movie. Game over, man, take my money. Number two, rap battles. I'm currently in the middle of Netflix Rhythm and Flow series. It's a great time, I'm loving it. It's like American Idol, but for rap. Like, hi, that's amazing. Rap battles today are nuts. They're crazy, they're intimate. Rap battles today are so impressive, but imagine getting schooled by a Viking yeah, you heard me. Imagine a Viking battling you and then just destroying everything that you care about after destroying you with words. You got a twofer. During those olden days, you needed a way to pass time. If you couldn't play hockey or slap fatten, and there weren't any villages to destroy, you always had poetry. Fighting comes from the Old Norse term flyta, which means provocation. Insult, exchange, but make it theater. Norse literature really has tales of their gods fighting. Imagine the next season of Loki and he's battling Freya. I'm like, come on, he's got this. It's hometown advantage. It wasn't to see who can diss the other's hometown the hardest, really, per se. This is actually a challenge in order to see who can spontaneously think of a poetic retort. In Anglo-Saxon England, flighting would go down during a great feast, enjoying roast while watching a roast. We love it. This was entertainment in the 15th and 16th century Scotland. Now we have, well, this. We just have me ranting about flighting. If you like it, give it a thumbs up. I'm doing my best. And finally, number one, go berserk. Whenever you're playing a video game, or like Assassin's Creed Valhalla per se, that health bar at the top starts to glow and you're ready. For a brief second, you can go beast mode, and then everyone can hit you with arrows and nothing happens. Right, you go berserk. Most games have this in some way, but did you know berserkers were a real thing in history? Just like Thor and Loki and everything else, apparently? Those Norse warriors would arrive to the battle decked out in bearskins. The term means to change form. So these guys were considered a higher power when it came to these battles. So you gotta call in the big dogs, or as they were described back then, mad dogs. They could take an opponent down with just one hit, and today, we have an idea of what may have helped the fight. The odds that the guys were on something, be it mushrooms, maybe they were hammered, are pretty high. Pun intended. Number 10, bears for pets. Okay, right off the bat, let's get crazy. Some of the hardest character deaths in Game of Thrones were definitely the dire wolves. Also, spoiler alert, but also you had eight years, so. Wolves as pets sounds like something Vikings would do for sure, but more often than not, they would just have dogs and cats just like us. Few of these animals were kept as pets, really. They all had a Viking purpose. They all had the big 
Cats probably had a big beard too, most likely. Viking cats belonged in the house to chase away rodents, just like they do today. Freya, the goddess of love in Norse mythology, rides in a cart that's being pulled by two cats. The cutest little cart ever. These cats were Egyptian. Most of the cats in Scandinavia came from Egypt at that time, and they adapted to a much colder climate. Viking dogs were also a thing. They were often found in graves next to human remains. So the man's best friend thing goes way back. They were hunting dogs and herding dogs, and they too followed their masters to Valhalla, hence why the bones would always be found together after death. Here's the crazy part though, Vikings would also domesticate bears from cubhood. Yeah, they would have Viking bears as pets. What a fun way to kick this list off. Number nine. Norse paganism. If you're a fan of the MCU, this, uh, this guy Thor here with the cape and the hammer and the big muscles, odds are you've heard of him before Nick Fury introduced you. Thor and Odin, they come from Norse mythology. The Aesir are the main gods of the pantheon. Those include Thor, Odin, and even Loki. And yes, in Norse mythology, they lived on Asgard. It's not just MCU stuff one of the nine realms. So they believed that if they fought hard enough and lived the most fierce warrior lives they could, they would end up in the halls of Valhalla to join Odin in the fires of Ragnarok, the most fierce battle of all. The Vikings didn't have a name for their religion at first, so when they eventually ran into Christianity, they called it the Old Way, which just sounds cool. It's like, ah, yes, the Old Way. It's referred to today as the Asatro, that's the worship of Norse gods. That term became popular in the 19th century, so it came much later. There was a Nordic religion society in Denmark that had around 600 members, and that was back in 1997, so pretty recently, and it was approved officially in 2003. Believers now can mostly be found throughout Denmark, Sweden, Norway, and Iceland. Number eight, horned helmets. Okay, when you think of Vikings, you probably imagine a very large man in a big ass beard with some horns. You got a horn to blow on, a horn to drink wine out of or something, or some ale, and then two horns here on your helmet. Just the horniest fella. Well, aside from looking cool, they would have, well, aside from looking cool, this horned helmet would have served absolutely no purpose to a warrior in combat. I don't know, unless there's a guy out there just headbutting all of his opponents individually, I don't know. The horned helmets were only introduced into Norse culture when costume designer Carl Emil Doppler made them for Norse themed operas in the 19th century. So it's really just modern art that we're thinking of. Also, Thor surely doesn't help. He has like wings on his helmet. I'm like, is that real or is that just Chris Hemsworth? I can't tell the difference. Number seven, hockey. I had to share this one, you know, being a Canadian and all, this one hurt. We found out that hockey wasn't our thing during Canada's 150th celebration. How epic is that? Oops, timing. I'm cold a lot of the time. My face hurts here in Canada. It hurts when I walk to the store and get my weird bagged milk and then I return back to my igloo. You know how it is. That's the idea, right? That Canadians are cold and they play hockey all the time. Well, honestly, yeah, pretty much. Not too far off. Well, hockey isn't just our favorite winter activity. Vikings loved it too. They actually brought it here in the first place, believe it or not. They didn't call it hockey also. They called it a way better name. They called it slap and fatten, which means to slap the fat around. You slap some fat with a stick. Me and the boys are gonna go around and do some road slap and fatten. <laughs> Car, heads up, pause the slap and fatten. Let's get out of here. Vikings would get sticks and try and slap some fat in between two posts. Imagine getting cross checked by a Viking. See you later, chest plate. Number six, what's that smell? You would think that just looking at a Viking that they would probably smell bad. I don't know, they're by the sea a lot, they're always damp, there's lots of hair. I mean, the beards alone probably suck up 1% of the ocean, barnacles and all that jazz. But believe it or not, these Vikings didn't smell bad. They were actually known for their hygiene. When excavations were done and all these sites that Vikings lived at, well, rather raided and then lived at, ancient hygiene tools were found. So like tweezers, combs, ear cleaners, they were into it. They weren't lucky enough to have Q-tips back then, so instead they used animal bones, which wouldn't hurt too much. Your eyes wouldn't really roll for that one, I don't think. It's just business, no pleasure. Vikings would bathe once a week, which to us sounds like a risky move, but once a week for that time period, that's amazing, that's unheard of. Queen Elizabeth I would only bathe once a month. So put that in comparison. Mind you, when you're hauling gear throughout a forest and then you have to use your ax for four hours straight, you might sweat a little bit more than the queen. Number five, Fletcher. I used to be an adventurer like you until I took an arrow to the knee. Somebody had to make these bad boys. Archery, it was an important part of medieval life. Just look at the long bowmen of England, they'll tell you. Bows and arrows may not be the first thing you think of when talking about Vikings, but judging from text, art, and other evidence suggests that archery played a major role in Viking life. 
Chances are, if you saw a longboat coming into your shores, there would be some burly blonde haired dudes with bows ready to find their targets. There's a part of me that thinks this is one time the player can blame the controller, or the arrows for that matter. Not every arrow is going to be perfect, so if something goes wrong, you can go back to base and yell at Young World. Number four. Law speaker. So, in Viking life, there were some rules and laws that applied to all Vikings, and some that were specific to each village or town. But they didn't have law books. There wasn't any kind of written law at all. No, instead, one lad from each town would go have the special task of being the law speaker. This was one person in town who would have the lovely job of memorizing every naughty thing that the members of the village weren't allowed to do. When a council meeting, which was literally called a thing took place. He was there to remind everyone of any law that was forgotten or to listen and memorize new laws that were made. Then he would waltz on down to the village law rock and recite that law to everyone who was not part of the thing. Now imagine if you forgot a law or if you worded it differently and that caused someone to find a loophole or imagine if you were someone who the law speaker didn't like. That guy can mess up your whole day. If the punishment for a crime was not death, it was sure damn close enough being exiled into the cold, harsh wilderness. Look, the Vikings came into contact with enough cultures who made a habit of writing things down. Get with the program. Number 3. Thrall Hey, I don't like it. Nobody likes it. It's YouTube's least favorite S word. Forced manual labor. Or you know what I'm talking about. Vikings were kind of twisted in that department, honestly. Like Adam said, sometimes for fun, they take you away for some good old fashioned manual labor. Also, like Adam said, this was a very successful and profitable business strategy. If there weren't laws that made employers pay a minimum wage, well, I'd hate to see a world without those laws. You know what I'm saying? It's a terrible thing to find yourself in. While there were some sort of sick buyback freedom program going on, the thrall system does echo with serfdom in the rest of Europe, which, if you look around, isn't around anymore. Probably for good reason. Number two, traders. Vikings weren't just mindless brutes who would run around plunging their axes and swords into people, getting drunk and wearing little to no clothing. I mean, yes, there was a fair share of that, but they were also very handy, excellent craftsmen and explorers. As they grew, some towns became trading centers, importing and exporting goods from lands far away. Through Russia, Vikings came into contact with Chinese and Persian traders who gave them spices and fine silks and amber. They would barter with things like weapons, furs, walrus ivory, and fish. They managed to get wine from France and Germany. But while these Vikings decided to trade in the danger of robbing for a more diplomatic profession, they still had to travel. And while they may be making hella bank, that doesn't really matter when you and your longboat carrying all your goods ends up at the bottom of the ocean. Like we said earlier in the video, Vikings were amazing boat builders, but they were not masters of the elements. And if Thor decides it's time for a storm, or if pirates got you in their sights, you gotta deal with the consequences. Number one, beekeeping. I'll admit it. I may be a cute husky guy who reminds people of other overweight comedians. I love candy and Farley too. And maybe sometimes I fart too much. But as it turns out, I have some fears too. I know, who would have thought? One thing I'm not cool with is flying insects, especially the ones that can hurt you. I don't like those ones. Bees and wasps. Ironic, I know. My little honeybees, I know, right? Who would have thought? I've never been stung before and I don't plan on it. With my luck, Adam's a super villain with thousands of bees at his disposable. Who knows? With all jokes aside, the Vikings had honey, which probably means they had some sort of beekeeping going on. We're not sure, however, how they did it. What I do know, though, is that they had no protection or smoke blowers. Maybe they did. Ah, tell you what, I'll enjoy the honey and let the crazy burly men take care of the harvesting. Starting our list off at number 10, the disappearance of the Norse. Norse mythology is fascinating yet mysterious, of course. They settled in Greenland around 1000 AD and they settled for over 400 years and then just like that, they disappeared, but not without leaving their mark first. Vikings invented hockey, they skied, women had a large amount of rights compared to what we usually see on this channel, right? That's a given. But one of life's greatest mysteries is where Greenland's Vikings went. Like I said, they disappeared, right? The only remains that are left Left are crumbling church walls that were used for not even 500 years. This is baffling. Archaeologists are still unsure of what happened to the Norse population. Maybe it was a plague, maybe it was the Inuit, or perhaps they settled back in Europe. Again, it's really hard to tell. Recent excavations provide hints that they settled in the West, most likely relying on trade to survive. So maybe they followed the goods and then they left naturally. Who knows? They used to call hockey Natalikir. That's uh, that's all I know personally. So in our number nine spot today, we have the creation. 
creation myth. Going right back to the beginning of things, the Norse believed that the universe emerged from an empty space separating the world of ice and fire. The first creature to come into being in the Norse creation myth was the giant called Emer. He is said to have been born from the moment the fire from Muspelheim and the ice from Niflheim met in the abyss of Gunyan Gaga. Emir had the ability to conceive asexually and his offspring spontaneously sprang from his armpit sweat and his legs. This is how Emer became the mother and father of the Jotuns who would later go on to become the enemies of the Norse gods. But eventually, Buri came into existence. Buri went on to have the grandchildren Vili, Ve, and Odin, we all know Odin, who decided to create the world and fill it with life, but unlike the Christian ideals and concept, the Norse deities couldn't just create life out of nothing. So naturally, they just killed Ymir and made the world out of his body. The sky was made from his skull, his brains became the clouds, his blood turned into the oceans, and his teeth were mountains and rocks. This gave even more power to the three brothers who then gave life and intelligence to humans. This creation story is thought to have really influenced the way that the Norse saw the world. They were living in a universe that was only made possible by death. Number eight, Norse or Viking. You may have asked yourself during this video already or at some point in your life, what is the difference between Norse and Viking? I watched Norsemen and now I wanna bark at dogs. That's my new dream job, just to bark at people all day, I guess. Norse and Viking both referred to the same group of people who both settled in Scandinavia in the medieval times. Now this all happened again around 1000 AD. The Norse are Norsemen, right? Guys who bark at dogs, you know, all that kind of stuff. The Vikings are also Norsemen, but they're just a little younger and a bit more, you know, a bit more energetic. A lot of this, a lot of this. A lot of height, you know what I mean? The Vikings were seafaring warriors while the Norsemen were involved in farming and trade and that sort of stuff. So there you go, now you know the difference. In our number seven spot today, we have golden apples. Golden apples are an incredibly important part of Norse mythology because of the fact that they need to be continually eaten by the Norse gods in order to maintain their immortality. It's not just like a free ticket, all right? They gotta consume a lot of golden apples. The apples also supplied the gods with their strength as well as their forever youth. The orchard that contained these apples was looked over by the goddess of spring, Idjin. I don't know how to say that, so I just went for it. The apples are extremely important to the mythology and in one story, when the goddess gets tricked into giving herself and the apples over to Loki, the gods immediately grew old and weak, but luckily she was returned and everyone's youth was restored. This led people to search for these golden apples at one point. Like, real humans. But even if they were to find one of these magic apples, you'd need a constant supply in order to maintain your immortality, and that might be more difficult than you think. Number six, Viking funerals. I really wish we still did Viking funerals. You know, every funeral I've been to in the last five years, it's all been a snooze fest. I'm like, yeah, they're old, we get it. Josh Groban, sure, let's change it up a bit. Where are all the horns? Where are all the flames? I wanna feel like I'm at a Greta Van Fleet concert, right? Viking funerals came in many different shapes and sizes. Sometimes they would bury the body and leave stone circles around the graves. That's pretty bad. Or sometimes they would do burial mounds. That's also pretty bad. Vikings were pagan, so they believed that the more smoke during a cremation, the better, seeing as smoke was their way of reaching the afterlife. And in Norse mythology, both symbolize safe passage to the afterlife. So Vikings would shape these stones placed around the graves. They would shape them like a vessel. Or these mounds would be shaped like giant boats of some sort, which is, again, pretty epic. Beats Josh Groban every time. But high-ranking Norsemen, that's where the fun comes into funeral. High-ranking Norsemen would be buried with their actual real-life vessels. Yeah, they'd be buried with their ship. Imagine that for a visitation. You'd be like, oh my god, how do I even get in? In 834 AD, the Osberg ship burial honored two women. The ship vessel was 70 feet long and 17 feet wide. 15 oars on each side. It was massive. It was discovered in Norway on a farm. So again, the whole shooting an arrow while they're at sea thing, it wasn't actually that common as badass as it is. Because if you missed, well, you just gave away the Osberg and you also botched the funeral. All in one spot. So, way to go. Number five, Thor's hammer. It's kind of hard not to talk about the Avengers movies because when you think of Thor and his hammer, it's really hard to not think about the handsome Hemsworths or the imagery from the movie. The story of Thor's hammer is rather interesting, however. So, Loki, being the trickster that he is, gave a competition to the master dwarfsmiths to create gifts for the gods. After enough gold to keep Scrooge McDuck happy and a sailboat that could fit in your pocket, 
Uh, the hammer was revealed, Mjolnir, a hammer that would never shatter, always hit its mark and return to Thor when thrown. Considering how many times Thor has thrown his hammer at his brother and his foes, I feel like it's safe to say that Loki's plans kind of backfired. Yet again, his plans backfire a lot actually. Number 4. Holder Holders are seductive creatures found in the woods, and if you thought they were scantily clad women, then you would also be correct, because why not? The name derives from covered or secret. Also, it may have something to do with mermaids. Obviously no fish tails here, but uh, similar creatures nonetheless. It's also said that if the holders are treated with respect, then they can be nice to humans, which is good. I like when things are nice to humans. Apparently fond of charcoal kiln burners and would respect them if they were left provisions. Not sure what a creature like that would want with charcoal, but... I don't know, maybe to keep warm because they're not wearing very much, I guess? Sure. This all sounds great, right? Well, maybe because some of them are looking to marry. Hubba hubba, let's go. Uh, trouble is, she's got a cow's tail. Guess that's better than a fish body, but if you see her cow tail before getting married, then she keeps the cow tail. Some of these tails are just insane. Number three, elves. Everyone loves elves. The population of elves seems to significantly increase when there's a fan expo in town. Hmm, go figure, I wonder why that is. Hmm. Elves in North mythology represent a small divine figure. Similar to the dwarves, they are creators of valuables and have their strong place in mythology. And for some reason, when the elves were no longer needed in the land of Vikings and Mead, they went to work for a fat man in a red coat in the North Pole. And before you even ask, yes, Father Christmas has his roots in North mythology. And yes, before you ask, I know him personally, and I will be telling him who's naughty and this year. Number two, Kraken. I always used to think the Kraken was something Johnny Depp and Davy Jones had to deal with, but that's just not the case. I mean, this is the reason why I have a fear of water I can't see the bottom of. Look, I have no fear of water and I have no issues swimming. I'm actually a surprisingly good swimmer. Chris would be surprised. But good swimmers or good sailors alike are no match for the Kraken. The Kraken is a large squid or octopus-like creature that preys on doomed sailors and ships. Using his large tentacles, he wraps himself around your vessel and pulls you to the cold depths below. Horrible. Some Norse depictions of the large suction cup beast are as big as islands. Maybe with enough hand holding and teamwork, you can take down a giant squid or octopus. Sure, maybe. Why not? But we're trying to take one down the size of an island? I don't think it's happening, dude. There's no shot, dude. I don't think so. Big as an island, you're gonna need a spear like this big. That's big. Number one, the droger. The unliving, the deceased. Past your expiration date. It is the end of a journey that we call life, and it seems pretty much every culture we have dealt with has had the most respect possible. A lot of ancient civilizations had their way of paying respects and staying close to the ones that they love, even in the afterlife. The Drogar, similar to the ones you find in Skyrim, are undead creatures with gray flesh that protect the tombs that are filled with gold and valuables from potential looters and robbers, and maybe the occasional dragonborn. Oftentimes, a lot of warriors were buried or put in such tombs, which means a lot of loot and ceremonial blades to commemorate the life of the warrior in question. I'm curious, folks, let us know if you had to be buried with something that you just can't part with even at the afterlife, what would it be? What would it be for me? I'd say video games, but I don't know, it might be some Lego or something. I'm, 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 let me some Legos, bro, let me some Legos. Yeah.